I thought my career would be over after this is what it feels like. This is not a lie. It was that feeling where, wow, I think we might be onto something really big here. And all hell broke loose. It was 2012. I just became um, a father to a beautiful daughter. I was like, okay, I'm at a point in my career where the trans thing is cool, but I want to move on. I felt stuck in the trans world a little bit because I didn't want to repeat myself and I wanted to do more pop songs. This is what it feels like was the, really the first time I actually went full on pop. If I look back on the creation of This Is What It Feels Like, uh, the first thing that springs to mind was a beautiful sunny day in my studio in Leiden. And uh, my good friend John Eubank uh, came by. Armin gave me a call and he said, uh, do you want to make some music sometime? I said, great, and Benno's here. And so I drove to Leiden, it took me an hour and a half to find the bloody place. He had a, a brilliant idea. He is a brilliant composer, he has, he's had massive hits in, uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, well, he, he was playing a melody and we were like, whoa, this is really great. He had some beautiful chords. Uh, in his head, which, what, which weren't fitting on a 4-4. Four four. There was 6-4 structure. And I think this What It Feels Like was one of the first riffs. Obviously it had a different lyric idea or something. I thought it was really beautiful. And um, uh, I never heard such a thing in a dance track before. So I was like, this could be really cool, you know. John comes from more of a songwriting background. And obviously Armin was in a, in a trans uh, era at that time, like Ferry Korsten that I'd already worked with. And, uh, and uh, so I really enjoyed that kind of music because it's very melody based. And, um, and he's, well, you know him, he's a very nice guy. Hi Armin, hi. Well, John Eubank, he had his ID laid down and we, well, we, we, tr we tried to, to make a sort of a demo for it. Uh, we added some elements that we already well had on our computers. It was not really fancy at all, uh, but it was just for reference, just to to make something. And then we sent it out to um, to composers and to a songwriter. Then I totally lost track of it because he sent it to uh, to Canada, to Jensen, and he connected with uh, Trevor, and they started working on it. Trevor wrote the lyric with a friend of his. I met up with Trevor, and uh, Trevor Trevor Guthrie. Uh, sung the vinyl vocals. And I don't even know how I survive. I won't make it to the show. I had just heard the chords that John had sent to, John Eubank had sent to Armin uh, to send out this track to for people to write. And um, I sat down, a few lyrics came out, some melodies came out, and at the end it was like, oh, without you now, this is what it feels like. I was like, wow, there's something there. And yeah, I could, I remember that. And it was like, I can see myself sitting in my little room down there in my studio. And I was like, wow, this, this could be something. The lyrics to This Is What It Feels Like are actually um, quite sad. If you break them down, I, I wrote them about a friend of mine that was diagnosed with brain cancer and they gave him you know, I think 11 weeks to live or something, um, not not good. And it was at the same time I came back from meeting Armin's camp um, from Holland. I was very excited about that situation, but at the same time, I'm finding out that my friend is not gonna be around. And so when I sat down, this is what it feels like. The lyrics, they just, you know, it kind of came out and I started writing it. I realized this is, this is about my friend, but you know, in the end it uh, turned out to be a very happy song. When I met up with Jensen in, I think, October around 80 or something to do a, do a gig here in the studio, he said, yeah, I was, I've been working on this track, and he played the track, and because it's so uh, different in chord, chord structure, I was like, hmm, I know this melody, and I was just, but I hadn't heard it, because I hadn't spoken to Armin. 
And obviously it was then a full-blown production. The funny thing was is that um, I had the instrumental and I forgot about it. I got the demo back and I remembered the chords, but there was something funny that happened to it. And then I started analyzing it and it turned out they pitched it down four semitones. The drums sounded really bad, but I heard the vocal and I was like, wow, this is amazing. And that was the original demo. So we threw away the original demo that I created with John and I started from scratch. A few, weeks, a few weeks went by and I opened the track again and that's when I came up with the, the piano. The -na 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 -na. That was a riff that I heard on the radio from a really old track. I thought that could be a cool way to maybe... It's just a melody idea. I do this all the time. This is not something new, but I remember switching on my studio, putting the MIDI in of the notes and then switching off my studio again. And then on Monday, Benno came by, my studio buddy, um, and I opened that and I said, I have an idea for this is what it feels like. So we were having coffee and I played him the piano idea and then he started to uh, fit the chords that I played into the, the, the actual chord structure that John Eubank originally put uh, in, the, in the first demo version. So, and we were like, wow, this is cool. This is something different, you know? And then it just, and then we put the vocal on top of it, and it was like, this is magical. Nothing to hold but the memories and frames. Oh, they remind me of the battle I faced. This was the first time for me that I'd given just like a piano melody, and it would go on a journey and come back as a full blown production. Somebody save me, I'm good. Well, the, the, one of the first demos that we made. To me, at least, it, it, it was just for reference. It was not like, okay, this is going to be it. And um, especially when, when we tried to work on it, we, we tried dozens of things that didn't really work at all. I looked at the original folder uh, in which we uh, put all the versions, because the way I work is, if I work on a track, I constantly save it as different version numbers. So, for example, if, if, if I work on a track, I start with version 1, version 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and, and, so, and on. So, at, at version 176, I, uh, I decided to go with the piano route. So, I saved it as, this is what it feels like, version 176, option 1. So, it was like sort of, you know, taking a sidestep from 176. So, I saved it as, a, as an alternative option, like this is another option. So, and I continued with that. So it was version 176, and then the final version was version 176, option 352. So <laughs> there was something like 500 saves uh, and renders before I came to the, 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 the really final master of things. And uh, at, at one point we had to go back to, to, to Trevor and Jensen to re-record re some of the vocals and you know, to record some extra backing vocals for the, for the track. So it was one of those tracks that wasn't finished in a day. The actual production of this, what it feels like, took more than a year to finish it. I got really nervous when the release date of this, what it feels like, uh, was approaching because I knew I was going to alienate some of my fans. And this is absolutely true. I thought my career would be over after this is what it feels like. This is not a lie. Because this was so pop, this was so dramatically different than everything else I'd done, that I seriously considered quitting after this is what it feels like. Because I knew like, you know, probably people are going to think I'm a sellout. But Piton was about to premiere the track. So it was before, and I was sitting in my hotel room and I had TweetDeck open, Twitter, you know, all the Twitter feeds. Pete Tong, I remember, you know, with his, with his iconic voice was announcing the track, world premiere of the new Army Van Buren. And right before Pete Tong premiered it, uh, I just received a master from Giuseppe Ottaviani, my good friend from Italy, who quickly made a transmix. So that same night I could play uh, that mix in my set in Bulgaria because I knew it was going out all around the world and I quickly wanted to show my fans, no, 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 I didn't alienate trends, you know, I, you know, I did a pop disc for radio, uh, this is a, a version I can play in my sets, kind of wanting to sell it to my fans, you know, because I was so afraid that the fans were going to hate it. Then Pitong premiered the track and all hell broke loose. All my fans hated it, exactly what I was afraid of. They hated it. Well, if I look at the comments now, probably I would say some of them hated it. I thought, this is it. This is it. 
I, I so remember sitting in my hotel room in Bulgaria thinking, this is it. This is it. This is the moment it's going to be. Now it's over. And some of the comments were really harsh, you know, like people can be on Twitter. And at the time I read everything. I read every single comment of people saying, you saw it sold out. This is trash. This is not trans. And it's true. It's not trans. And it became my biggest track. It became a Grammy nominated. Uh, I have a whole wall in my house that's just filled with plaques from this is what it feels like. And still I feel there's, a, there's still this little voice inside that feels like my fans mean so much to me, you know. I didn't want to alienate them, but I was like I was struggling with finding the balance of you know getting that creative freedom and wanting to please my fans. I was on stage the first time I heard Armin play this. <laughs> it was also there singing. Um, that was Ultra 2013, I believe it was. Yeah, I believe it was 2013. Um, I hadn't performed a crowd that big since Soul Decision, and that was 10 years prior to that, if not longer. So walking out there, not knowing what to expect. Again, I'm not familiar with EDM, and I started singing, and I could hear people like, "Wow, like." They know the song already. This has literally been out for a week. And, you know, that happened to me, you know, maybe 15 years previous to that with Soul Decision. And it was that feeling where, wow, I think we might be onto something really big here. So, yeah, that's a pretty good feeling. <laughs> I think after a year, yeah, 2013, they phoned me up, Armada, and they asked me if I would want to do like an um, acoustic version so that they would have you know, extra content uh, surrounding the track. Um, and I was in Ibiza and I was just playing around on the piano and I thought well, it would be great to do it with a uh, full-blown orchestra because you don't really have that a lot in, uh, in dance music. Um, <clears throat> so I made an arrangement, uh, sent it back, and they really liked it. So I, I went to the studio with uh, people from the Metropolitan Orchestra that I, that I know, because I work with them a lot on the other music that I do. And um, yeah, that one came out, and it was amazing. I really, really like that track. I say this is what it feels like changed my life you know it um, put me around the world and met a lot of great people I got to have a revived uh, revived career after Soul Decision which was very difficult to do so um, it's also a song that was written from a different point of view in, in one of the first time of my career where I approached it from a different headspace and you know that's something I try to do now when I write so yeah it was a game changer I think the most proud of it is that we we actually did something uh, that we learn to let something go to make something bigger. There's a lot of things about the track that that are extra special for me. For me, it's the first time really that I went o overseas. It was the very first time that I ever met Armin and we went into the studio and this developed out of it. It, it was not only one of my most successful songs, but it was also, I was breaking away from the chains that I put on myself about the, the stuff I thought my fans wanted to hear. My career really went gradually, you know. I had my first big success in 2000 with communication and then slowly built with Burned With Desire and then In and Out Of Love and, you know, it was really like a, a gradual thing. And in 2013, when the Intense Tour happened and when I started touring, 
all of a sudden I played for sold out stadiums everywhere around the world. And it was kind of, everything came together. And I still think that that is one of the best things I've ever done in my career, I, I guess. I guess this is what it feels like. <laughs> <laughs>